Hello everybody and welcome back to a new video. Today we're going to be doing another beginner's guide episode and today we're going to be talking about the band King Crimson, who you're all familiar with of course. Um, so I've done a bunch of these other beginner's guide videos, I've got a playlist and you can check them out if you wish to. We've done one on just progressive rock in general, we did one on the Grateful Dead and one on the Mars Volta. I say we because sometimes me and my dad do them together but this one's just me today and we'll be talking about King Crimson. Now King Crimson has quite a big history and a very extensive list of previous members that a lot of people have come and left from that band so I'm gonna try my best to cover everything even the parts I don't know as much about for example, I'm not as familiar with the Lizard and Islands era and also anything post Red onwards. So anything in the 80s onwards, I'm not as familiar with. But I'm going to try and give the best possible information to you guys. Because even though this isn't a video strictly about their history or anything like that, it's still good to inform people of the group, the people who want to get into them. So let's begin some brief history of this group, how they became the big monsters of prog that they are today and possibly one of the most well-known progressive rock groups of all time. So our story begins in Dorset in England which is in the south of the UK and starts with a little trio called Giles, Giles and Fripp which consists of Michael Giles, Peter Giles who are brothers and Robert Fripp. So these three people, they were in this group, and they were making like pop music, like 60s pop music. So this was around 1967. And after a while, Robert Fripp, who we all know, decided that he didn't want to do pop music anymore and he wanted to try out something different and a bit more interesting. He abandoned this project and decided to take one of the members of that band and go and create King Crimson. And he got fellow school friend Greg Lake who we know from Emerson Lake and Palmer these two were close they went to the same primary school I think uh, so they knew each other he got him in to do bass and vocals and some other members as well Peter Sinfield writing all the lyrics and also um, Ian McDonald as well who was keyboards I think this first incarnation went on to record and release the very, very well-known album in the Court of the Crimson King, which we all know is one of the greatest albums of all time, known as one of the greatest albums of all time. And this lineup did not last very long, unfortunately. It carried on a little bit into In the Wake of Poseidon, which was their second album. And um, I think some people left, some people were doing stuff on that album. But let's just go back to In the Court of the Crimson King for a second. So this album was released in 1969, so end of the 60s, so it's one of the first big progressive rock albums and obviously got really successful and every and they were doing tours and stuff like that with the Rolling Stones. I think they were at the Hyde Park gig in 1969. I've seen that little snippet on YouTube. And so they made this album and then they went on to make In the Wake of Poseidon, which was in 1970. And a lot of people consider this album just not good at all because it's like a follow-up album to a masterpiece that is in the court of the crimson king personally i love in the wake of poseidon i like the themes i love the lyrics and i love the music it's just so different to in the court of the crimson king but it's just so much more relaxing and uh, very much an easy listen so in that incarnation greg lake still did vocals on this album apart from one song which was sung by Gordon Haskell, who only did vocals for one track on that album, but Greg Lake did the rest of it. So this was like the same lineup, but a little bit different, a few alterations here and there. In the same year was Lizard, which is a completely different album from both of those two, which had a completely new lineup. I have to keep looking over here because my computer's over here, because I tend to forget a lot, so. So on the Lizard lineup, we have Gordon Haskell, who did vocals, Robert Fripp, of course, Mel Collins, Andy McCulloch? Uh, on drums and Peter Sinfield still on writing lyrics. Now Lizard, as I said, that just comes across like I don't know the album very well, which I don't. I don't know this album as well as something like In the Court of the Crimson King or Red or Lark's Tongues and Aspic. So bear with me here. So Lizard came out in 1970 in the same year as In the Wake of Poseidon. And then following that, in 1971, we had Islands, which is very much like a smooth jazz kind of album. Very, very good album. Um, 
I've listened to it a few times now and I absolutely love it. Uh, so on this lineup, we have new singer that I don't... Boz Burrell on vocals, obviously Robert Fripp and Peter Sinfield still in the group, and Mel Collins and Ian Wallace on drums. So this is a completely different lineup to everything else, but fantastic album, but very different to a lot of their other stuff, which really does make them a progressive rock band because they're making progressive music, their career is progressing. And from that lineup, which I'm not as familiar with, we have the most well-known lineup from the Larks, Tongues and Aspect era up to Red. So in that lineup, I can kind of name it off my head so I don't have to keep looking that way. Bill Bruford joined from Yes to do drums for this, for this group. Uh, John Wetton on bass and vocals. Robert Fripp, of course, still in the group. David Cross on violin and mellotron, I believe. And I think just for Larks, Tongues and Aspect, Jamie Muir, who was a percussionist, who, who added a lot of interesting sounds to that album. I mean, if you've seen the live version of Lux Tongues and Aspic, it's crazy when he's on it. And that is a fantastic album. Definitely one that I wouldn't give to someone on the first try of getting into King Crimson, but I will go on to that once I finish talking about the history. Uh, and that lineup continued up until Red. So we have... Starless and Bible Black after Lark's Tongues, and then Red, which is my personal favourite King Crimson album. After those two albums, King Crimson just took a hiatus and did not release anything. I don't even think they toured up until 1981, when they then released Discipline, uh, which is their first 80s album. And after that, we have Beat, Three of a Perfect Pair. And so those three were like the main 80s ones. They have the very minimalist covers, if you've seen them. Um, I'm yet to discover that side of King Crimson. So in that lineup, we still have Bill Bruford, but we have some new members, of course, and Robert Fripp. Uh, Tony Levin, who's an absolutely fantastic bass guitarist. Um, he did a lot of work with Liquid Tension Experiment, which is the super group with the Dream Theater members, um, Mike Portnoy and Tony Levin. Um, and Adrian Bilu, Bellew, who is a fantastic guitarist as well. So And vocals, he did that as well. So this is another lineup that I'm less familiar with, but I'm trying to talk about every year of King Crimson here. But then they made that kind of trio of albums in the 80s, which seemed to have done really well. I think a lot of people rave about them a lot, so I'm, I, I want to get in on that. Um, and then we go into the 90s with things like Vroom, Thrack and stuff like that which Thrack is a fantastic album. I think that's the only post-Red album that I've listened to because I um, was watching a King Crimson interview and they were playing stuff from Thrack in the background. So I was like, oh, I like this. So I just decided to listen to the album. Um, and that lineup consisted of Adrian Bellew, still, uh, Robert Fripp, Tony Levin, Bill Bruford, um, which is another great lineup, I think. I'm yet to hear it, but... Uh, it sounds like it's a, it's a good time. Uh, so they have, King Crimson had so many members and there's one particular reason why they had so many members and that was Robert Fripp uh, being the picky musician that he is. I, I consider him one of my biggest influences. King Crimson are one of my biggest influences and I have the biggest amount of respect for him. But from what I've heard from ex-King Crimson members, he was not the easiest to work with, which is probably why they went through so many members. Um, he treated this band like it was his child, so he was very proud of it. Of course, it's something to definitely be proud of, um, but I actually heard, read in an interview that he made people cry. Like, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but that's not very unlikely. Um, so, yeah, that's... Robert Fripp is like the driving force behind this band. He's been there since day one, so props to him. So we've gone through like a little brief history. I know it's, my thing says it's hit nine minutes now, so it's not very brief, but I'm going to go on to the albums that I would recommend that you listen to in order if you're a first time King Crimson listener. So I assume people who are watching this video are either subscribers of mine or people who want to get into King Crimson. So I'm gonna do an order of albums that I think would be the best to follow. You don't have to necessarily follow it, but this is my recommendation into the band because I think this is the best way to go about it. So I'd say the first album to definitely pick up if you wanna get into this group 
it will always be in the court of the crimson king because this album has such a variation for a first time prog fan or a first time king crimson listener you've got the harder rocky things of 21st century schizoid man you've got the acoustic things of i talk to the wind you've got the improv bits of the title track and you've got beautiful songwriting it's just a great varied album and i think this is great for someone who wants to get into king crimson or wants to get into progressive rock in general because you get a feel for what king crimson's all about what their music like and what you are to expect later on even though they do progress and get more experimental later on this is definitely something to start with so this is in the court of the crimson king 1969 one of the first big progressive rock album i mean probably the, the biggest progressive rock album at the time so you've listened to in the court of the crimson king where do you go from here because you've listened to it so many times but you want to get into more king crimson stuff I would then go for In the Wake of Poseidon. This is an absolutely beautiful record. Uh, this opens out like that, which is kind of cool. Um, this is very moody bluesy. So if you like things like the moody blues and that kind of melancholy sound, you will love this album. And I think that I might even put this one before in the Court of the Crimson King if it's someone who's fresh into King Crimson. But this has got... It's got some harder rocky things, but it's not experimental at all. It's very, very relaxing, very calm, and just very beautiful. And I know a lot of people don't like this album, but I think it's a great, great album to get a feel for King Crimson's softer side, if you will. But this is a fantastic one to get into. Um, this is In the Wake of Poseidon. Uh, this was released in 1970. So you've listened to those two albums and you want a bit more of a challenge. Where do you go from here? I would say Red, because even though I've jumped a few years now, um, there is still a lot of hard rockiness to this album, even though it's progressive rock. It's very chunky sounding, so if you like things like Black Sabbath or if you like things like Led Zeppelin, you'll probably like this album. Um, but there is that track, Providence. If you are familiar with the album, if you've listened to it, you know about that track. It's an eight minute long avant-garde neoclassical piece which is very crazy i used to skip it because i didn't like it very much but that is why this one is not in the top spots because that track in particular is quite a challenging one it took a long time for me to get into i mean the tracks are a lot longer as well and it's just very 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 dark album as well it's got great lyrics not written by peter sinfield i now realize that um but it is still a great great album a very solid album i think providence i've come to accept that that is an important part of this album and the way it flows so i probably put this one third so if you listen to red you like the feel of red you know you like the kind of harder chunky bits of it and you like the softer parts of starless and fallen angel and stuff like that you want something a little bit more challenging i'd say islands because it's even though it's quite like a smooth jazzy kind of album it's like listening to a jazz album. So if you're not familiar with the kind of structure of a jazz album or long periods of no singing and long periods of just experimentation and improvisation, very much jazz orientated, then this is for you. If you're not into that, this probably is not going to be your favourite King Crimson album. It took a while for me to, to like this one as well, um, but it is a very beautiful album. Once you get it, you get it and you love it. And I've re-listened to this so many times. It's so, so great. And one that I would recommend to people who like jazz and want to get into progressive rock. This is the album for you. You've listened to all of those and you're thinking, where do I go from here? I want something a bit more challenging, something that's challenging to the ears something that's gonna something that's gonna make me think and all that kind of stuff i would probably put lark's tongues and aspic this it was released in 1972 and this is probably by far in the 1969 to 74 catalog one of the most experimental albums of that section uh it's got you know some very very beautiful parts of it you know things like book of saturday and exiles but you've got kind of the challenging parts of the title tracks and you know even things you know the talking drum as well like stuff that took a while for me to like and kind of appreciate but once you learn to appreciate this album you uh, i just listen to it non-stop and you will end up not and you will end up not listening 
and you will end up listening to this non-stop like I did. Um, but this is one to definitely kind of steer clear of if you're not into experimentation, if you're not into things like avant-garde crazy music with weird chord progressions or weird note placements, just very unhinged in a way. Um, but this is a fantastic album, the percussionist um, Jamie Moyer does a very great job on this album. I really like the extra percussion bits. I know I haven't mentioned Starless and Bible Black and Lizard, but those two albums I'm not sure where to place because I'm not as familiar with those two records as I am with those records that I just showed you. But um, I, I think that Lizard would be one to steer clear of. Uh, I'll, ha I'll hold it up now. Lizard would definitely be one to steer clear of if you don't like. I reckon listen to this after Lark's Tongues and Aspect because this one took a long time for me to like. I did not like this one at all at first, um, but it is very, very good and I'm yet to kind of get into it again because I didn't really like it at first. Um, but definitely want to check out after that and I reckon that Starless and Bible Back could probably with Islands like in the same league. like you've listened to Red, now check out this. It was released in the same year, I believe. Um, it is a fantastic album, but I'm not as familiar with it. I love Lament and Fracture. Those are two very great tracks. So I reckon I'd put this in the same category as Islands, something that's a little bit more challenging than Red um, because it's longer as well, but still very, very pretty and very beautiful in its own way. So that is the end of my King Crimson video. If you're a fan of King Crimson, what's your favourite album? What's your favourite era? Let me know down below. And I will see you guys on Wednesday for my very, very delayed review. But I will tell you what the review is because I think I've kept you waiting long enough. This week's review is going to be on Mirage by Camel, which is a very fantastic album released in 1974, I believe. Um, a very It's a classic prog album. And yeah, I will see you guys on Wednesday. So if you know anyone who wants to get into King Crimson or if you want to get into King Crimson yourself, then share this video with anyone you like. It'd be great to get some more people on our side into the prog world. All right, see you guys later. Bye.